I want to talk about how soldiers coped with fear in World War I, and in particular, two soldiers. Um, the two men in this photograph are my family members. The man sitting is my great-grandfather, Andrew Thompson, who I'm named after. And his younger brother, John, is standing behind him. Uh, Andrew would volunteer to serve in France in 1914. His brother, John, would be uh, drafted two years later. And you might be asking yourself, why would anyone volunteer to fight in World War I? Uh, and the propaganda game was really strong. Uh, there was some fabulous art created to uh, convince young men to go to France. Uh, here's a French poster that's just amazing. And drives home uh, how threatening Germany was on the continent at this time. Uh, the German uh, industrial capacity and birth rate was expanding incredibly fast. And in the echelons of the military of the Entente powers, they were concerned that if they didn't go to war with Germany in the next five years, they would never win. And the Germans didn't help themselves either. Uh, the first thing that they did when they marched was invade Belgium, which was a neutral country. And they uh, did collective punishment of uh, Belgian resistors. And this is definitely against the rules. Not that the British tabloids needed help. Um, many tales of German atrocities were true, but many were fabricated in whole cloth and printed in uh, British newspapers. So uh, you had hordes of uh, young Britons signing up to be in the all-volunteer army of 1914. Uh, and they should have been more cautious. Um, the things that they would come to fear um, upon contact with the enemy would be notably this gun. This is called the Maxim gun, and it was designed by an American and licensed to most of the combatants. Uh, this particular weapon could fire continuously, and I mean continuously. It would never stop, and that was because it was water-cooled, which was the principal innovation. Science. science. Deadly science. Um, artillery also made massive advances during this period, and people did not understand that the game had been changed. Um, in particular, uh, people used to have a hard time fabricating uh, unlimited amounts of gunpowder, but that would be solved in the early months of the war, and that would really change the game in terms of artillery. Uh, this particular gun launched 400-pound shells. 30 years prior, the largest gun that you would see in an infantry engagement would have been 6 to 12 pounds. And in fact, they are still digging these up in Belgium today. Um, cars drive around from the government to pick up unexploded ordnance that is left on the side of the road. Uh, the other thing they should have feared was their terrible equipment. Um, the French army was particularly egregious. Uh, these cavalrymen are wearing Napoleonic era uniforms with bright red pants. <laughs> they were sitting ducks. Artillery spotters would see them miles away and shell them. Um, this is a picture of my great grandfather as he prepared to deploy. And he is wearing a hat. That's not a helmet. The British would spend the first year of the conflict without helmets. <laughs> Charging was also very popular in the 1870s. Not a great idea in 1914. Uh, the French military orthodoxy was entirely built around the spirit of the charge. They have a word for it. It's all over the Arc de Triomphe. And it was a terrible idea. And the French literally ran at the Germans for the first two weeks of the conflict and lost 75,000 killed. That's roughly 1.3 times as many as Americans lost in the entire Vietnam War. And they did it in two weeks. Um, so people often portray the First World War as unlearned lessons, but they actually picked this lesson up really quick. Two weeks in, they started digging holes. And they would continue to dig holes for the next four years. Um, trench warfare is what we largely think of as the horrible era of World War I, and that is justified. I had the fortune to go visit some trenches a few years ago, and the thing that's really terrible about trench warfare in Belgium is that Belgium is cold, it is wet, and it is miserable. And trench foot became a really big problem. People's feet would rot out. 
from standing in the trenches. And this was a much bigger problem than the shooting. It turned out that in the opening months of the conflict, everyone ran out of bullets. And so they were living in the trenches and waiting for resupply to happen. And it turns out that if you're living in semi-dangerous conditions for long periods of time, a new psychosis develops, shell shock. Um, the army had no idea what this was. Many thousands of people were uh, court-martialed and shot um, for uh, shirking, but really they were shell shock victims. And um, I actually have the diary here, uh, the war diary from 1916 of John Thompson. And um, the remediation for shell shock was that the health service discovered that if you rotated troops in and out, they didn't develop shell shock. And that was actually the fix. So what they would do is they would send you up to the front, you'd spend four days, and you'd come back, you'd be six weeks off. And they would do this rotation over and over again. So in the year of 1916, he would do four rounds um, in the trenches. Um, so when you're in the rear, you need a different kind of distraction because you're not in terrible danger, you're just mostly bored. And uh, there was a lot of ways that people coped with their homesickness and loneliness. Uh, John, in this photograph, is in some kind of sports league. We're not sure what it was. Um, brothels, very popular. Uh, <laughs> gambling was also very popular. For some reason, the Australians have this terrible reputation as cutthroat gamblers. I don't know why, but all the books bring it up. Um, uh, this is a letter that John wrote back to his family, and I actually have this in the back if anybody wants to see it later. Um, in the front... Uh, Maps, the coping was very different, uh, mostly hard labor. All of those trenches were dug by hand. You couldn't get tractors in there because they'd be bombed. Everyone dug that out by hand, and it went for hundreds of miles, three trenches deep, six feet down, as well as forts. And all of that stuff was brought in by hand. All of the munitions were brought in by hand, all of the food. And they just worked the guys into absolute exhaustion. So I guess what I'm trying to convey is that the trench warfare aspect of World War I was kind of simmering and the boiling danger of World War I was offensives. And offensive had kind of a, a shape to them. Uh, in the winter, the scientists and engineers would develop some new terrible weapon, and then they would have a, everyone gather in one place, and then they would attack and try to break through. And poison gas came about this way, creeping barrage, tanks, underground mines, lots of different weapons technologies were developed to attempt to break out. Um, and this is the more traditional kind of warfare bravery that we think of, where you're charging into some kind of crazy attack. Um, this quote is from somebody who's essentially telling everybody, look, you all, you're all are going to die. And that's a weird thing about people, but they'll do it. And one of the people who heard this particular speech said, yeah, I felt better after. I felt numb. So how many times can you do that? Well, not very many. And um, the weapons just continued to get more and more terrible. Uh, this is a picture that I took at the site of the first gassing site in Flanders. And the, everyone in the trench died. And then the Canadians were <laughs> sent to fill in the gap. And they didn't know what had happened. And what they came upon were thousands of dead Frenchmen who had clawed their eyes out trying to catch breath and they held off the German advance. Terrifying. Living among the corpses eventually burned everyone out. And when you get to the end of 1917, early 1918, you start seeing civil governments collapse. The Russian Revolution, you start seeing widespread um, uh, desertion and mutinies. And some of these things are actually now just becoming declassified. Um, so there's actually new documents coming out right now. Um, my great-grandfather would actually survive the war. And he would... He would leave the old world behind, um, in part because of the death of his brother. Um, we said that the offensives were quite dangerous and uh, John fell as a tank gunner in a battle in France uh, in 1917. 
And of the few things that my great-grandfather brought to the New World, um, the burial scroll of his brother is one of them. Um, and this plaque comes with it. It says, he whom this scroll commemorates was numbered among those who at the call of king and country left all that was dear to them, endured hardness, faced danger, and finally passed out of the sight of men by the path of duty and self-sacrifice, giving up their own lives that others might live in freedom. Let those who come after see to it that his name is not forgotten. And so I raise my glass to John Thompson and all those who fell in World War I. Um, their name liveth forevermore. <laughs>